That's a nice round of applause. This is my first time at Mindshare. Thank you very much for having me. And thank you for sticking me after a guy who brings sight back to blind people. <laughs> Fucking following Jesus up here. You know? it's like, <laughs> Blessed are the joke makers. Um, all right. So, but the guy after me is talking about porn, so I know you're going to stick around. I'm going to talk about laughter. My goal for tonight is uh, that perhaps afterwards you'll hear laughter differently. Um, your own laughter, other people's laughter. It, is, it seems like something very simple. If something's funny, we laugh at it. But there are so many other things going on to induce laughter. And it's these so many things I want to talk about tonight. All these different variables that come into play when we come into contact with comedy. Now this is something I've been interested in since I was a little kid. I've always wanted to understand the laugh. What was really going on behind that sound? And there was one laugh that, uh, I mean, studied this all my life. One laugh took me 15 years to figure out. It's an episode of Mary Tyler Moore. I saw it when I was a teenager. And it's an episode where Mary uh, dates her boss, Lou Grant. And they've been friends for a while. They decide to go on a date. And it ends up in this very awkward situation in her apartment. And they go in for a kiss. And they both realize just how wrong this is. And they crack up at the absurdity of it. And that's where the laugh comes in. The studio audience in that episode, there's a loud shriek of laughter and then kind of a sudden taper, kind of an unsatisfying laugh, not the full body laugh you expect at the end of a show like that. And I kind of remembered it just feeling a little odd and forgot about it. Fifteen years later, I'm running Cheers, and I write a bit for Norm, if you remember the show. And he, um, in the bit, he talks about how he's, this is the day he's going to get up his, off his ass and get a job and tell his wife he loves her, but he can't even get through it with a straight face and he cracks himself up. All right? So we're shooting the show, he does the joke, and suddenly I hear the same laugh I've heard 15 years earlier, the studio audience, loud shriek of laughter, sudden taper. And suddenly I understand the studio audience's laugh from 15 years earlier on Mary Tyler Moore. Now, at the end of the talk, I'll give you a chance to figure out what it was. You'll have all the pieces. You already sort of do. But uh, you can take a crack at, at, at what accounts for that laugh. Anyway, uh, the way we're going to... I need a clicker thing, don't I? There we go. The way we're going to talk about this is rather than just go through and dissect jokes all day, that, that sort of thing, we're going to talk about the comedic event. We're going to dissect that because comedy is experiential. It has to be experienced in order to exist. And to understand a laugh, a response, we have to understand all of it. The context, we have to understand exactly what's happening. So the overview, we have a receiver. This could be you, me, anyone, the audience. <laughs> who then comes into contact with comedic information. Symbolized by triangle, we'll get to that. Now, this does not necessarily have to be a formally constructed joke. It could be something as simple as watching your dog chase a flashlight beam or you feed your baby a pickle and it makes a face and you laugh. It's any information that gives you a comedic response. In this case, our subjects come across a linguistic joke that goes like this. The doctor says to Mr. Jones, Mr. Jones, I'm afraid you're gonna have to stop masturbating. And Mr. Jones says, why? And the doctor says, so I can examine you. <laughs> I'm preparing you for the talk after mine, the porn talk. I'm sort of Mindshare's fluffer. Anyway. Anyway, you've had your response to the joke, and now our subjects have their response. By the way, school kids love this joke. If you're ever talking to a kindergartner, tell the joke about the doctor and Mr. Jones. All right. So we have a receiver, we have our comedic information, we have a response. But what we're going to do is we're going to zoom in. We're going to look at uh, more closely what's happening. Really, what's happening in those arrows. Because it's in those aero arrows that all these variables come into play. When we write and create comedy, there are uh, dozens and dozens of ways to manipulate the way you think, the way you feel, in order to, to provoke laughter. And so I'm going to talk about those, and we'll talk a little bit about comedic structure as well. So that first set of arrows there is we have our receiver. First of all, we have elements of context, which are going to come into play long before we even reach the comedic material. Now, some of this you're going to look at and roll your eyes and go, obviously, but it will get more complicated. Okay, so for example, I tell the joke I just told, I could tell it here at Mindshare, or I could tell it, tell it at a funeral. Exact same joke, perhaps different responses. Perhaps not. Okay. <laughs> obviously, we have our baseline reception factors. That's you, the receiver. How are you feeling physically? Are you feeling emotionally? Are, if, you're, if you're sick, something might be less funny than if you're well. If you're a little drunk, a little tired, it might be more funny. Physical condition really will affect the way you respond to material. I'll give you a great example. My wife was watching the movie Space Jam at a critical time in her cycle. <laughs> and when Michael Jordan made the final shot, she burst into tears. <laughs> 
Social context. Obviously, if you're with a bunch of your friends, you're a group of people, you're more likely to laugh and laugh louder than you are if you're watching something on your own. If the source of the comedy is with you in the room, same thing, because communication is part of laughter. All right, this is all pretty obvious. You've probably seen a comedy in a full theater as opposed to an empty theater, and the laughs are very different. Vehicle. Uh, jokes often, often, usually, appear in larger man-made creative constructs, narrative vehicles like novels, plays, books, TV shows, uh, you know, movies, whatever. And our predisposition to how we feel about these vehicles will affect how we uh, respond to the joke within. For example, there are jokes that we would throw out of the writer's room on a sitcom for not being good enough, and those same jokes we will later see, like on a Broadway stage, get applause and huge laughter. I've seen you do it, you bastards. <laughs> And it's because, I'm not really mad, it's because uh, you have a different set of expectations going in. Sitcoms are pretty disposable, they're on all the time, they're free, you flip to the next one, whatever, but in a play you, you make the reservation, you go to the theater, you sit down, it's a big thing, and it will change the way you look at jokes inside. Feelings about the source, very simple. Uh, if someone you love tells you a joke versus someone you hate telling you the same joke, you'll have a different response. I met George Burns once, which is a big thrill of my life. I met George Burns. And he said, so what do you do, besides bad impressions? And I say, uh, <laughs> I say, I'm a writer. And he says, <laughs> he says, so write something. And of course, I fell down laughing. You know, it was hilarious. <laughs> and I'm walking away. Ten minutes later, I think, that's not funny. <laughs> but it's George freaking Burns. I love him. Feelings for the source. That dictated my entire laugh. That was the primary factor in a response. Okay, now we're going to talk about, uh, we're going to get to the triangle now. Comedic information has two core variables, all of it. It has a level of incongruity and a degree of cognitive process it takes to understand the completed picture, to assemble the completed picture. And we start with our receiver and a setup which implies rules. Now a setup does not have to be a formally introduced setup, two guys walk into a bar or whatever. It could be just basically our, our knowledge of the understanding of the normative ways that the world works from which we actually build incongruity. We see how things are normally, we see how something is different, we understand incongruity. So we have a setup, we have a source. The source's one job is to supply new information. We'll call it the punchline, but again, not formally punchline as we usually uh, define it. Uh, it could be any information that is then connected mentally by the receiver. The receiver has to add information from A to B to put together a new concept which will contain some level of incongruity. It may be a low incongruity, it might be like a high crazy behavioral incongruity, it might be impossible incongruity, talking animals and that sort of thing. And uh, our recognition of safe incongruity leads to a visceral response and that response expresses itself in laughter. Now why do we laugh at the recognition of incongruity? Well, there's the thought that this is a very, very ancient kind of thing on our parts. As before we were like, we are now very proto-human beings, we were hardwired, and still are, to see incongruity, to notice incongruity. Why? Because something that happens out of the ordinary could eat us and kill us, okay? So imagine us as proto, sort of pre-language beings, and a twig snaps at the wrong time, or a shadow comes at the wrong place. What happens? Our blood pumps, our hearts pound, our hackles raise, our adrenaline flows. We are ready to fight, flee, or die. And then it turns out to be a safe incongruity. It turned out to be a falling tree. It turned out to be my own shadow, whatever. And suddenly we are awash in relief. Okay, and this is a physiological response. Chemicals are coursing through us, and we are thrilled. We associate with this with the joy of the knowledge that we live another day. And we look at the people next to us, these other proto-beings, and we're all feeling the same thing, and we're all going, ha, 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 ha. Perhaps you've done this in movie theaters when a scary movie like startles you and then you're like, ah, and then you kind of look at each other and go, ha, 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 ha. All right. So what, how is that comedy today? Well, I think that what happens is the recognition of safe incongruity still triggers these little trace switches in our primal mind, just a quick on and off to give us that little sense of, of uh, incongruity, that safe incongruity bringing us that, that little tiny bit of jolt of, of, well, joy that we associate with joy. And that's how comedy...